Okay, thank you for inviting me, uh, and thank you for staying until the end. I think it's great. Now, being in the last day and the penultimate speaker, everything has been said, which means that I'm free to say what I want, and I will use that. So I work with a large team, and uh, the first line is the MHD. I'm going to talk a bit about MHD. And the second line is a mixture, but we're also looking at stratified flows, and I discovered yesterday that I was doing cosmology a very large scale, being stratified, so I love that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about ideal and dissipative structures. I will uh, talk about some surprises from a classical homogeneous isotropic turbulence. Well, when you put waves, and in particular gravity waves, now this is not self-gravitation, we have a big mass here. Uh, so there are some surprises, the flow behaves differently. And then uh, I will use those surprises to try to justify a big run. So, of course, there is turbulence in the universe, and very frankly, I didn't hear too much about it because well, the turbulence is there, but we can handle it one way or another implicitly. And by the way, there is also turbulence in bacteria, so it's really from very large scales to very small scales. Now, a seminal observation published in 1981 and then a remake in 95 by Armstrong and his collaborators is that on a very large uh, range of scales, you have scaling, here it is the density, and that scaling resembles a Kolmogorov. Never mind exactly the slope, but basically, as you look at uh, structures with different techniques, you can see that the universe is not completely random, but in fact obeys some laws. We just have to find which laws, right? Okay, now same thing for the clouds. Now the clouds you have, you can go even down to the micrometer, and the microphysicist meteorologists say that's the most important part. The turbulence is kind of there, and you go all the way to 1,000 or even 10,000 kilometers, and uh, the range of scale is also very big. Now, in fact, if you want to make rain here, it takes you three days with a linear theory. If now you put the turbulence, and the turbulence is intermittent, and the intermittent provides acceleration which are 10 times that of gravity, then it takes three hours, which is more likely to be true. So turbulence does play a role because of multiscale interactions on what happens on the chemistry and whatever at the smaller scale. So those problems are kind of uh, similar to what you do, Guy. If you do a frequency analysis of papers on uh, clouds, cloud controlling factors uh, exactly, you see that turbulence is a big guy in town. And for the same reason as for you, it is because it does transport and uh, all kinds of things. Kolmogorov said, probably in 1941, that I soon understood that there was little hope of developing a pure closed theory. And because of absence of such a theory, the investigation must be based on hypotheses obtained on processing experimental data. And I hope that today he would add observational and numerical. <clears throat> In other words, we're going to progress by uh, coupling between the theoreticians and the people having the data to contradict the theoreticians, of course. So what is turbulence? Well, it's this. You cannot really define the velocity in every point. It fluctuates very strongly, but it fluctuates around the mean. So you're going to talk about moments of the velocity field and other fields, and therefore you have a closure problem because your equations are nonlinear. That closure problem is solved either by twisting the physics and hoping for the best and testing against uh, numerical simulations or experiments, and that has been done for many years. But if you're looking, if you have waves, that means that you have a small parameter in the problem, which is the ratio of the characteristic time of the waves to the eighty turn of the time. This is small. You expand, small parameter, you can close the equations naturally. The problem is that that expansion is non-uniform in scale because the wave, through its dispersion law, and the nonlinear time through the dependence of the velocity on scale, vary with scale at different rates. So there, there exists a scale at which better boom back to strong turbulence, right? And for those who wouldn't know, we're going to input energy at the large scale, say through tidal waves, through or whatever other processes. It's going to cascade down to small scales through magic of trigonometric functions, or if you prefer, um, well, anyway. 
and uh, at small scale it would be dissipated. The magic is that the energy inputted here does not accumulate, but goes all the way down and is dissipated. And dimensional analysis will give you the chromograph spectrum. You can change that spectrum by changing the characteristic time of the problem. But that's another story. So some state-of-the-art science runs in turbulence. That is to say, not the runs done for 10 times that. But the science that has been done with those guys, Canada really deserves a special mention because he published a 4,000 cube in 2003. He did that on the Earth simulator, and he had the help of the whole engineering team uh, to produce this. And they've been analyzing that data in length. And P.K. Jung has now done it in the US in 2012. He added uh, passive traces, which of, of course is very interesting. And uh, we have the supersonic run of Federat that we heard about, the channel flow of Moser, and I'm told that they're going to go to higher resolutions. We heard uh, Paul this morning with a staggering trillion grid. Um, the stratified turbulence, the best guy in town, is uh, this uh, young woman here with the 4,000 square by 2,000. And uh, you also have peak codes in plasma that have 10 to the 12 and more particles. In our team, we have those two runs in the box. And the first one is analyzed. We run on 36,000 to possibly 69,000 processes. We scale strongly, and Yannick will show, I think, some pictures. Uh, but the problem is that we use spectral methods, and therefore they're very slow. And one of the sobering facts is that if you take a 4,000 cube resolution, and if you look at how many modes you have at the smallest scale, well, you have many, 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 and you wonder why you treat them so accurately for so long. So I think we have to move on. And as you add the physics, um, and you want to be closer to modeling very complex objects, the, the uh, spectral accuracy is not necessarily uh, what you want first. But there are problems like singularity and what are the sharper structure that develop and why and how, then you may want that, uh, you still want that accuracy. So what does grid resolution buy you? Well, here is what we did a long time ago, right? A 64 cube. Here is 256 and we felt, ha ha, we're almost there, guys. And then you move to 1000 and 2000 cube. And what do you see? Yellow, dark, yellow, dark. Yellow, dark, what do you mean are straight lines in the universe? This is a trace of the initial conditions or the forcing. Turbulent flows have memory effects, and that has been shown uh, on a few of them, and those memory effects show up. Now, of course, if instead of forcing with a very simple flow, which here is the Taylor Green flow, we are forcing with a random flow, which is what Canada has done, then you have a match, right? We have porridge. This is very discouraging to know that we compute every single of those filaments with spectral accuracy. There is some holes, but I'm not sure AMR will work on such a flow. But homogeneous isotropic turbulence has never been met to, to, have, um, to have AMR. Now, where do we go? Do we converge? So here is what is called a Taylor balance number, which is characteristic of, say, intermediate scales. And um, here is the dissipation. So it's the viscosity new times the square vorticity integrated over the box. Now, as you go to high Reynolds number, uh, you have less dissipation, right? Wrong. In fact, the flow manages to produce that porridge very small scales, so that on average, dissipation is all order one. So from, from a physicist point of view, we have converged. You give me 150 here to 1,200 is a factor 8 or 2 to the 3. I have three octaves. Now, mathematicians would like three decades, and that is, you know, somewhere in Switzerland, it's very far, very costly. But from the physicist's point of view, dissipation is of order one, and uh, the flow is going to produce the structures you need um, to dissipate the energy you inject. If you zoom on the structures, they're vortex filaments, as you may know, and we drew some field lines around them, they're highly helical, and you can see the vortex filaments twist around each other. In fact, what is called the helicity, which is the, um, the scalar product of velocity and vorticity, is maximal in those vortex filaments, which means that the lamp vector u cross omega, which is the nonlinear term within the pressure term in the incompressible case, the lamp vector is zero. In other words, turbulence is going to fabricate structures that kill the nonlinear terms, the guys who gave them birth. 
can you believe that? And that's part of the reason why you can get out without really resolving the flow. Now here's the same thing in MHD. Now the structures are current sheets. And we have seen several examples of that with compressibility added. But it's the same story. You do have some bubbles, which some people would call plasmoid. And I'm going to zoom on that guy here. And what you see is um, a current sheet. So the thickness is given by the dissipation that I put by hand. And you can see that they roll up. Now, it took that resolution to see them roll up. So there is another scale which is created in the system, which I don't really know what it is. But in MHD, just like for the case for fluids, you form uh, alignment between the magnetic potential and the magnetic field. So give me that it is also between the current and the field. That means that the Lorentz force is weak. And an alignment between the velocity and the magnetic field, that means that all the flow is weak. So nonlinear terms create structures that kill themselves in MHD2. So that's one thing that turbulent flow will do for you. Now, this is the biggest uh, run I know in MHD, except that we cheat it, so it's not that big, because we implemented symmetries. And what you develop in the ideal phase uh, is two current sheets. But those two current sheets are special. That current sheet, the magnetic field is in the sheet in that direction. And the other current sheet, the magnetic field is in that direction. So what you create is a very fast rotational quasi-discontinuity, which have been observed in the solar wind, and we have not looked for them in dissipative MHD, so I think that would be interesting. Here is lines every two pixels, and you see that between the two sheets, it turns very, very fast. So that's one of the structures that they've learned. Okay, the code, I will say very little, uh, you certainly can have it. It's pseudo-spectral, which means it is slow, but it does scale very well. And it does Navier-Stokes, rotation, passive scalar, magnetic fields, all current, Boussines, and some modeling. That is to say, we also have some subgrid modeling in, in this model on Lagrangian traces. OK, and now I want to look at the problem, do waves alter the dynamics? So let me take the Boussinesque equation, so that's the usual Navier-Stokes equations with a pressure gradient. N is the boom Weissala frequency, and B is not the magnetic field, it's the buoyancy, so either density or temperature. In the Z direction, I'm going to put rotation in the same direction, because otherwise that would be too complicated. And some external force, like tidal flows, or, of course, radiation to the Earth. Now, it's incompressible. The three dimensionless parameters of the problem are the Reynolds number, which is the ratio of the dissipation time to the nonlinear time. When it is large, dissipation just takes a long time. Maybe not, because we saw that, in fact, dissipation is all the one in the turbulent flow. And those two guys are the ratio of the wave time, the gravity wave here, the inertial wave here, to the nonlinear time. When this is small, the waves are fast, and they're going to do things. In particular, they're going to prevent turbulence from developing at least for a while. Um, now, nonlinear terms are complicated, so let's kill them. Now, in homogeneous isotropic turbulence, if you kill them, there's not much left, but here there is. So you can have a balance between pressure gradients, buoyancy, and rotation. It's called geostrophic balance, and meteorologists got a lot of mileage out of it. Because, in fact, you can look at some of the maps and understand them in those terms. Except that at one point, the nonlinear terms have to come back. So it's quasi geostrophy and it's quasi two dimensional, in fact. For the astrophysicists who are interested, with stratification and rotation, you can produce helicity. This was shown by Hyde in 1976. And we verified numerically that indeed it occurs, including when the nonlinear terms uh, grow. So with helicity, you can play and make uh, magnetic fields which you might be interested in. OK, so let's take two flows at the same resolution, same Reynolds number. But what they're going to have is two different food number, 0 0.1, 0 0.03. And that's how they look like. That's the temperature fluctuation. And you see that here, the turbulence is fighting and giving a good fight. So this flow is rather complex. And you have one, two, three, four layers. Because here, the turbulence is having a real hard time. 
and you have rather stratified flows with layers, you could think of clouds, except that here there is a Kelvin and Mold trace, and we're not the only one to find it, okay? And there are one to about 12 layers. In other words, the Brun Weissala frequency is going to tell me how many layers I have, or in other words, because that's a ZX plane cut, I forgot to say, in other words, it's going to tell me the width of those layers that enter in the dynamics. And here is a blow up of this structure here. Now, another thing is intermittency. I showed you this part of the diagram, I didn't show you that. This is data taken somewhere at the wind farm, and this is killing the wind farms. Because all of a sudden, there is a very big jump. And they'd like to predict those, so they'd like to have people, uh, specialists in intermittency and data analysis, to be able to shut down their, their whatever you call them, windmill. So intermittency is the fact that you have very strong jumps at very small scales, and they are sparse in time or sparse in space. This is taken again from the Canada and Company run, and they show the vorticity square, which is proportional to the dissipation, and you can see the dissipation is highly non-local and very strong in a few places. In fact, this argument has been used by Edith Falgaron and other people to uh, explain some of the molecular lines in uh, molecular clouds. Because locally you have a lot of heat and then you can excite higher levels of the molecules even though your clouds are, at, say, between 10 and 30 degrees. So the way you measure that, you already heard about it, is a velocity difference on the scale L, L, and then you take several powers, and the distances are 2 to the n delta x. So when is Z, n is 0, here we are at the grid. When n is 9, here we are really at the size of the box. At the size of the box, the velocity difference is Gaussian. The brown here is Gaussian, green is some data. At the size of the grid, or a bit larger, the PDF develop wings. That's one of the trademark of turbulence is that the velocity gradients and the magnetic field gradients, for that matter, develop structures like this. If you look at uh, the intermittency for the climate, I've worked over 20 years, I think, and if you know nothing about climate, there is something that's striking in this picture. It's green kind of everywhere, and green is Gaussian, so it's linear, basically except in the tropics where you have yellow and even some red, that is to say go into a skewness of order one, skewness is the third order moment of here the temperature normalized and therefore a skewness of one means trouble, big trouble. The tropic is the problem uh, to understand the climate better. It's strongly nonlinear, even though those people think in um, waves. Now those observations have been done, here is water and here is a quantum fluid. The velocity again has wings. Here is a cluster that is to say looking at the solar wind, at magnetic field fluctuations or at velocity fluctuations, and again you find some wings. So all of a sudden we find that in fact there is more wings than we thought in the velocity itself. And that's what we found with um, the Boussinesque equations. To our surprise, um, the velocity itself is intermittent. It is more intermittent, the orange and the green, when I have stronger waves. Now, if you think a bit about that, that's a bit strange, right? Because if you think of a wave, oh, I understand a wave, right? No big surprise there. And all of a sudden, it um, cohabitates with the turbulence to produce even stronger velocities. Now, mind you, if you are explicit in time, in fact, a factor two in the velocity, you're going to see it. And in fact, that's how we found it. But we had to stop the code and uh, lower the time step. So another lesson of turbulence is that stronger intermittency for stronger waves in a plage of parameter, where in fact the nonlinear term and the wave term kind of balance each other. OK, I come to the, I don't know how I'm doing with time, but I come to the, OK. So those spectra, I mean, this is a turbulent stoke, right? You're going to see spectra. So those spectra are here the potential energy for the two flows that we've seen uh, um, the temperature for. One is a moderate food number in blue, and the other one is a higher um, gravity. 
gravity waves and a, a smaller food number. And what is striking is that flat up to here, then decays. This one is flat up to here, then decays. And same thing with the helicity spectrum. Flat decays flat for a long time. The ratio between those two scales is about a factor three. The ratio between those two guys is about a factor three. There is a scale in this problem which is linked directly to the buoyancy, and it's called the buoyancy scale, and it is in fact the vertical scale that is developed in a stratified flow. By the way, it is observed. At night, in the planetary boundary layer, you can observe a flat spectrum when the, the boundary layer is very stable. So we did not invent it. Now you can look at something else, because those flows are highly anisotropic. After all, you're imposing a direction um, pretty strongly with both rotation and stratification. So you could look at spectra, but in two dimensions. That is to say, where phi is the core latitude, the angle between the wave vector and the imposed direction of gravity and rotation. And what you have is different spectra for different angles, which makes life complicated when you look at the sum. But you still see these two scales of the flat spectrum uh, appearing. And now you have another scale where all those guys come together, kind of, right? Here and here. So now I have another scale, which is called the Osmidov scale, which is where, in fact, I'm going to recover a model of spectrum and isotropy. At this scale, no, it's not exactly isotropic, right? That's because I'm 3D and having resolution is not easy. But at this scale, I cannot recover the isotropy of the flow. And again, there is a ratio which scales as n to the 3 halves. So in stratified turbulence, there are two transitional length scales. One is the buoyancy in the vertical, and one is the Osmidov scale. So how can you do that in three dimensions? Let me skip this. And um, have a pre-conclusion. Turbulence is not maybe your traditional definition, but there are multi-scale interactions and memory effects. Let's not forget that. There is a depletion of non-linearities in the dissipative structures. And there is, of course, intermittency and anomalous transport properties. Do waves alter the dynamics? The answer is absolutely yes, at least for stratification or the combination of strat and rot. Um, the intermittency of the vertical velocity is very pronounced and produces problems. Um, the accumulation of energy at the forcing scale, which I didn't show you, you have to resolve the resonances. So you cannot be box limited. You cannot force at the box. You have to leave space. And unfortunately, space looks like at least the factor six or seven. And that's true also for other types of waves, like uh, in nonlinear optics. You have both shallower and steeper spectra, and they depend on those two length scales, which themselves depend with different power laws on stratification. And something I didn't show, but in fact, energy is completely schizophrenic in such flows. If you force at an intermediate scale, it goes both to the large scales and to the small scales with constant flux, which is, for some people, difficult to understand. So let me propose a big run. I take a grid of 24,000 cube, bigger than Paul, uh, which is six times 4,000. So in principle, it could be feasible, right? Six to the power of four is uh, 1,200, in fact. I have, this is my box. I have to leave some place, some room here, because of that problem of resonances that have to work. And then I put a factor 10 between the forcing and the buoyancy scale, the, the width of the strata in the vertical, the factor 10 between buoyancy and the osmidov, the factor 10 between osmidov and dissipation, and then a little room after dissipation so that the core code doesn't blow up. Now, unbeknownst to some of you, I've defined the Reynolds number and the buoyancy number by doing that choice. I know what they are, OK? The Reynolds number is this, which is a factor 1,000 to some power, with waves, we can push them. So I'll f maybe we can go to 10 to the 5. The full number is something that's a factor 10. And therefore, it's about 0 0.01, which is a rather realistic number. Not quite, but not so bad. Now, numerical modeling, what is it? A spectrum. I cut here because I can't afford all that. And I do something to model the effect of those scales on the larger scales, both an eddy viscosity and an eddy noise. 
Paul told us about the beating this morning. And then I can put a model, an LES here in the isotropic range, or here in the anisotropic range of the big ones will also be useful to test and perfect making and make perfect uh, subgrid scale modeling. Of course, if we, you want us to spend more time on the computer, we can add a lot of physics, like Lagrangian particles, MHD, chemistry. We can try to be intelligent while we compute to save time. And uh, one of the things I'm thinking about right now is sparse Fourier method, which we tried a long time ago, and maybe we should revive them because of all those modes in the larger scale. And thank you.